All right. I hope everyone can see the screen. Let me know if you can't, please. I think I'm just going to start so that we have um, enough time because it's going to be fairly, fairly tough to get, get through this all. All right. So my name is Andrew Lamb. I'm going to talk. I, I have, I've been thinking a lot about data fusion. I've worked on it for, for quite a while, and I've prepared some architecture slides to help people understand what it is. I'm going to present it in three parts because it, it takes quite a long time to present. So the first part I'm going to talk about is uh, this talk, which is basically what a query engine is and why you might need one. And obviously, this will be about data fusion too, but it's, it's going to be more general to try to set up what it is and what it isn't. And then the next two talks I'll give over the next uh, week or so, we'll talk about logical planning and physical planning. So today I'm presenting, uh, this is a little bit of background about myself. I'm sorry for the mugshot. I currently work at Influx Data. We use Data Fusion a lot uh, for our product called IOX. Previously, I spent several years working on uh, other database products, Vertica specifically. I also worked at Oracle for a while. And I've done various other other things too. So I, I've, I've been around databases, specifically analytic databases, for for quite a while. As I said today, I'm going to focus on part one, which is what the query engine is and why you might need one. And then eventually we'll get off to um, part two and three on another uh, half hour time. We'll talk about query planning, execution, and then also um, yeah, get into the actual execution. So without further ado, let's start with part one. What is a query engine? So if you'll permit me a moment to talk like really, really high level, like basically many since the dawn of computers, you have data stored somewhere. And right? it's basically what computers do. And you have users who want to access that data. Uh, maybe they want to write a program, but almost always they don't. They want to access it through maybe a graphical UI or a command line or uh, you know some kind of uh, way to interact with the system. And one of the most enduring APIs were like uh, logical abstractions that's persisted in the, the, the computer industry for like 40 years, right? Is that rather than all these individual programs having their own file format and managing them, uh, there's actually a, a query engine behind it. So that separates how the data is stored and the details of how it's stored, how it's queried, how you get it from the actual use and what these programs want. And so that lets these programs focus on what they're best at, showing the data, manipulating it with the user. And the thing that worries about the details of getting the data, storing it, um, rearranging it, all that stuff is, is you know, a database system. So typically you use SQL. Um, it's the very common interface, but SQL is not the only query language, right? You can see there's many, many query languages you've probably heard of, right? I just quickly Googled InfluxQL, PromQL, LogQL, all sorts of stuff. They don't have to end in QL, but they're query languages. And the, the, the key thing is that they describe what the user wants, not how to get it, right? The how to get it is the responsibility of the query engine. So that's at a high level why, you know, these things are important because they separate the how you get the data from what you want. And that lets, uh, that, that, and that abstraction, like I said, has been around for a long time. So I now want to make a distinction between database systems and query engines. So database systems are things like InfluxDB or Postgres or Apache or DuckDB or Apache Spark or DuckDB or SQLite or, you know, there's lots and lots of query uh, database management systems. And I wanted to make a distinction that Data Fusion is not, I don't think, a database management system. It's a query engine. Let me explain what that difference is. So DBMS, of course, stands for database management systems. What makes a database management system, and the reason it's not just called a query engine, is because it has a system to actually you know, store the data, has some way of storing information about where the data is on whatever storage system, like, so that's typically called a catalog. It's got the query engine, which is what most people think of when they perhaps think about interacting with a database, because that's the interface in which they do interact, right? They use SQL, so they are, think about databases as just SQL, but it's the query engine is an important part, but not the only part. There's also in typical database systems, you have some kind of access control and authorization, right? To like say who can look at the data and who can't. There's things that worry about how to divide resources among users and maybe among them, maybe even the same user with different queries or something. There's some ways to like look at the overall system usage and set policies or whatever. So, so the point, and then of course you have to figure out how to connect it to the rest of the ecosystem. If you have a distributed system, you have to worry about multi-node 
and how how you feel find the other nodes and have them all work together. So the my point is not to talk about any of these in detail necessarily, but my point is like the query engine's part of this, but not all of it. And I think that's very deliberate, right? Data, uh, data fusion is not des designed or or likely to be ever a, a complete database management system. It's designed to be able to you know be just this part of one. So yes, you can build database management systems, but you can build other things as well. So what else can you build with data <laughs> query engines? Like I said, you can build analytic. Well, you can build database uh, databases in general. Since data fusion is focused on the analytic work case, right? Not uh, which is how to crunch large amounts of data quickly. You know that I would describe that as an analytic database. So you can definitely use data fusion to make an analytic database. And there's quite a few examples of those already. I suspect a bunch of people on this call or watching the video will will be interested in this. So the product I work on, if Oxdb Iox is a database, like a complete database management system, uses IOC, uh, uses data fusion under the covers as the query engine. There's a, a project called SeriesDB, which does something similar, Apache Ballista likewise, and there's a bunch of other ones too you can find on the website. I think you don't have to build a complete database system, right? You can use a query engine for other things, specifically if you're just interested in building a new query language, for example, that just operates on files or whatever, you don't need to build a whole um, database system like I just described, but you can do things like uh, some of our users with PRQL or Vega Fusion, where there's like domain specific query languages that are that are good for particular use cases. Instead of having to like rebuild all the infrastructure, which we're going to talk about in Data Fusion, you can just reuse the Data Fusion query engine or the, the parts that are most important. Uh, if you're doing research, this is my pitch. I think we've all, I've had one that I know of, which is a someone was doing research on what software as a serve um, like function as a service platforms could be used for databases so again rather than like implementing their own query engine or building some toy one uh, there's a program called flock that used data fusion and just customized it for what was special about the research and this one I don't know maybe depending on how you think about this you know if you're trying to transpose CSV or JSON or something to other file formats like parquet or Avro just the, the just the translation of the file format doesn't you know probably doesn't need a query engine but as soon as you start doing things like filtering or ordering the data or um possibly aggregating it as soon as you start doing anything like that then the query engine maybe is like the kind of thing you want to put in one of these tools and in fact we have some examples of people who built relatively you know simple clis that, that do quite powerful things because they could reuse data fusion like a qv for example all right, so why do you need data fusion? Here's a slide I love to put out, which is uh, having been involved in databases for a while, I've, I've had the good fortune to work on all these pieces sort of over time, but I'll tell you it, it's a lot. So what this is, is this meant to be a timeline of, of like deciding when you're, you're, you're gonna build a database to when you you know eventually will have a good one. And the point of this is not that we're gonna go over all these details, but when you decide to start a database, there's a lot of things you have to, to worry about. This is going to obviously pay attention to uh, be, be relevant to data fusion because it's going to help. So you have to worry about how you represent the data in memory, what type system you're going to use, how you're going to, you know, then some code to filter it, what query language you're going to use, and you have to write a parser for that like, query language and a basic planner. You have to be able to operate on the data. You need to be able to somehow persist it. You probably want to do some op you know, and then only then do you have something that people would even recognize as a database. And then there's a subsequent set of phases where you, you go through like optimizing the storage and you implement date times and joins and resource management and like all this other stuff that none of it in particular is like impossible, but it's just a lot of work. And you need a lot before you get to something that's pretty good. And the point of this slide is that between Arrow and Data Fusion, you can start with a pretty, pretty far along this timeline without having to re-implement it all yourself. So that's 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 why you'd want to use data fusion is if you want something with all these features but don't have to implement it all yourself. And so that's that's like one way to think about it. So now you might ask Andrew, you say that this great stuff about a custom, you know, this query engine, but every database system I know of has its own custom query engine in it, right? Like in fact if you look at InfluxDB, not IOX, but the the current open source one, um, it's definitely got its own query language. All these other systems have basically a specialized custom query engine in them. And that's how databases have been built for the last 30 years. 
as you can probably guess, given my previous slide, I think this is both very expensive to build. This is why a lot of these systems, right, took tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in VC funding to get somewhere, or like 30 years, like Postgres, because right? there's a huge amount of stuff you need to build in a in a in the database, including the query engine, right? Then there's a whole bunch of other stuff too. And I think the other real challenge is not necessarily that it has a high barrier to entry, but that it's got a significant amount of effort to, to maintain. So like once you get to a certain point, you, it's very hard to drive these forward without huge investments. And so that's why I personally think something like data fusion, where you can avoid having to re-implement stuff that's really not specific, right? Like the vectorized engine in Snowflake is, is basically the same as the vectorized engine in, in um, DuckDB, you know, I get to at this level high hand wave away. It's obviously not exactly the same, but like the ideas are the same. It all came from the same day as research. Um, actually, from the like the, those ones in particular, probably are more similar than, than other ones. But anyway, the, the point is they but they had to re-implement it themselves. So, you know, that's that's where I think the database industry is headed rather than all these individual custom systems you're going to end up with high quality open source components like data fusion. And don't just take my word for it. So if you read, if you're familiar with Andy Pablo, he's a database researcher at CMU and well-respected in the database field. He wrote a summary about databases in 2022. The reason I bring this up is if you look carefully, one of his paragraphs in there talks about one of these long-term trends is that frameworks like data fusion, right? You actually see data fusion in there and Polars and, and Velox and other ones, you know, it's effectively uh, commoditizing the execution engine. So that means if you want to be able to compete or build a new database system in the next five years, right, the the, the way the ecosystem is trending is that you'll use something like data fusion rather than hand rolling it yourself. Uh, you know, I'm sure people, there will be people who continue to hand roll it, but the people who use data fusion will get, or similar systems will get a significant head up, right? And, and they'll be very fast. All right. So, yeah. So, like I was saying, in my opinion, this is where the future of database is headed. Obviously, this is a bit of a pitch for data fusion, but it, I think it's real, right? Is that you have these shared high quality open source engines like data fusion, Velox from Facebook is a C one. There's probably a few more that will arrive, uh, or maybe that are already arrived that I don't know about. And then you'll have systems that are built on top of data fusion or the other engines that focus on their specific use case. So like, for example, Influx data focuses on time series. I think so does Series DB. Sineda is a streaming platform. Um, so that, you know, the energies of those companies and those projects will be focused on the things that make them, like they're really valuable for their customers ra uh, rather than all the basics of like a, of a fast columnar engine because they're able to take advantage of data fusion. So I think I think this is where it's headed. I think data fusion is ahead of the trend, and I'm very excited to see where it goes. Yeah. All right. So what is data fusion? For a couple of minutes, I'm going to now start going into details about what data fusion is, and then I'll maybe show a little bit of a demo just to give you a sense. So data fusion, if you read, creates the I/O description that calls itself an in-memory query engine that uses Apache Arrow as the memory model. While we're talking about data fusion, I wanted to make it clear. You know, it, it has arrow in the name. The reason it has arrow in the name is because Apache arrow in the name is because it's part of the Apache arrow project. It's not actually like part of a spec that there's a there's a memory model that's described the arrow memory model that, that is the spec and has like the 13 language implementations or whatever. It, the data fusion is not equivalent. Like there's not um, a spec for data fusion. Data fusion is just a project. It happens to govern inside the same project. Uh, organizational structure, but it's a it's a distinct project from Arrow, like the code. Although of course it uses Arrow under the covers. I don't know if you all know, but where actually data fusion came from was not um, a product directly, I don't think. It was a guy named Andy Grove who's still uh, active in the project, does the releases actually. He wrote a book called How Query Engines Work. There's a link to it on these slides, which I'll share later. And it basically describes sort of a classic textbook um, description of how a query engine is laid out. And then I, I think it's actually written in Scala perhaps, but then he implemented that design in Rust and then donated that to the Apache Foundation, the Apache Arrow project specifically. And so that, it's that foundation on which Data Fusion is built. Uh, yeah, so consequently it, it, it looks very much like a standard query engine and that's I think a really good thing. 
So the goals of data fusion, what like what are the main goals of it? Again, it's not to be a database, right? It's to be this high performance query engine, in particular since it's written in Rust and uses Arrow and it doesn't have a garbage collector. It's designed to be high performance. And I'll show you that some examples of that in a second. It's meant very importantly to be easy to connect and interoperate with the rest of the Arrow ecosystem. Well, really the rest of the ecosystem and our bet is that Arrow is a is a enabling technology there. So you can connect it and it's built in, obviously it uses Arrow all over the place, both at the edges and internally. Also it uh, does easily connects with Parquet and Flight and other technologies that are designed to easily integrate. It's also designed very much to be able to be embedded and customized. I'll talk about this in a second. The idea is that you don't just get like the flavor of what data fusion does, it does, and you can't do anything with it. It's designed to be extended pretty much at every location solely for the use case that we were describing, right? If you, you can build a new system on top of data fusion and pick where you're going to spend your effort to, to make it better and uh, invest your, your uh, innovation dollars rather than have to do all the, the basic grunt work here. Uh, the other thing too is it's not just like C++ implementation with Rust bindings. It's actually meant to be Rust from the beginning. It's entirely written in Rust. And uh, that's, I think, one of the key differences when you talk about stuff like Velox or maybe some people talk like you could use DuckDB for some of the same use cases you can. Um, and maybe that's the right use case. But uh, that's also, that's like written in C++. So I think the fact that Data Fusion is entirely in Rust is, uh, is, a, is another differentiator. We spend a lot of time on testing and integrating with the rest of the Arrow ecosystems. So I like to believe it's very high quality, as you might expect from something that you're going to use to build uh, databases on top of. My personal goal, right, might not be everyone's goal. My personal goal is if you want to have a query engine in Rust, that you that there's basically data fusion is by far the best the best possible choice. So that's that's what I'm working towards. All right, so let's talk about. Something that's not just Andrew basically doing technical marketing, not marketing, putting, just laying, the, laying the foundation, but it's some version of technical marketing. So here is the actual system architecture, the way I think about data fusion. And this again is like if you picked up a textbook about query engine design or you looked at any of the sort of analytic systems over the last 10 years that have been designed, they'd all have approximately the same structures. These things probably get called something different, but they're, they're the same things. So there's a variety of data sources that um come with data fusion to help you get started so there's obviously ways to connect to parquet and csv that are and json and avro which are fairly sophisticated but there's also an api to extend it yourself it comes with basically two built-in uh ways to generate query plans one it has a sql planner which we'll just talk about more next time and it also has a way to programmatically build it up with a data frame api or, or a logical plan builder it then has a whole complete representation of uh, logical plans, which are the like a relational data flow graph. Again, this is like the whole topic of part two of this series. We'll be talking about logical plans and what they are and how they use. But there's a way to represent sort of relational operators, right, that describe a data flow graph, which is how database systems work. There's a variety of optimizations and transformations that happen on those logical plans to make the plans more efficient. Then there's a Correspond, you know, most systems have a split between sort of a higher level description of the execution plan and then a lower level plan, a lower level plan. So does data fusion, we call them logical plans at the, the higher level. They're called execution plans at the lower level or the physical level. And that also has a bunch of optimizations and transformations. And then there's a the actual execution implementation of these plans like filtering or grouping or joining or whatever. Those there's a whole bunch of implementations of those. That, uh, that are all sort of very highly optimized and are, are based on error record batches. Again, we'll talk a lot about that in subsequent talks. So this is the, the high level architecture, sort of the major pieces that I, the way I think about data fusion. One of the things, as I've been mentioning, that's I think really quite cool about data fusion and is very important is that you can extend pretty much anywhere. So obviously you can add your own data sources. That's probably not super surprising. So you can read off whatever file format you might want as long as it can produce um, data in the arrow record batch format. Likewise, you can extend the front ends so you can write your own code that goes and builds logical plans, right? You don't have to use SQL or translate what you have into SQL. You can build the plans directly so you can add your own front ends. You can add your own logical plan nodes. We do this in IOX. I know other people 
will do this in other systems where if there's a relational operator that you know does not come built in with data fusion because it's something specific to what you're doing, uh, you can still add that to data fusion and have it work just fine. There's an extension of points and traces to do that. Likewise, if there's specific optimizations that are important for your use case, you can hook those into data fusion. You can do the same thing both at the logical plan. You probably also need an execution plan uh, for the corresponding logical plan if you can't use existing ones. So there's a way to do that in data fusion as well. Likewise, if you need to extend the operators, you can. The actual implementations of these, these little things. And if you need to add your own, you know, functions or aggregate functions, uh, there's there's ways to do that. So you can add your own expressions as well. So like in my mind now, this is the toolkit that you need if you want to go build a database system, right? You get you get a good foundation to start, and then you can extend it wherever you need. Focus on what makes your system special. So I think here's I think you know just a list in textual format of the places you can extend it. So you can obviously have user defined functions or user defined aggregates. You can add user defined optimizer passes both in the logical and physical uh, execution plan levels. You can add your own nodes. So those are you can add nodes in the relational operator graph that uh, that makes up plans. Obviously, add your own data data provider for table source. You can have your own catalog, right? There's an in-memory catalog that comes with data fusion. But if you have a more sophisticated need for a catalog, like what tables there are, what schemas there are, that kind of stuff, there's APIs for that. Yeah. And like I said, most of these things have some built-in implementations and data fusion gets you going fast, but you can extend them pretty much whenever you want. So I think what I'd like to do now is spend the last 10 minutes or so of this talk just showing data fusion a little bit in action. And so I'm going to do like a mini demo. To start the demo, I need to explain what this is. So I've been talking a lot about data fusion and it's a query engine and it does whatever. Um, it comes with a program called Data Fusion CLI, which is just like this tiny little wrapper on top of the Data Fusion engine. So this is an example of the kind of program you can write, right? Like with, I don't know, a thousand lines of code or something less than that, you can get a CLI that does mostly the CLI handling. You get a full featured SQL, you know, engine that's kind of, that look kind of like uh, SQLite or DuckDB or something. So that's what I'm going to show as a demo, but the point is not to show off the Data Fusion CLI as the best tool ever, or it's a, it's a tool to show what's happening, uh, what's available in this engine. And there's some links to the docs here. All right, so hope, hopefully, can you all still see my screen? I hope. Um, I hope that, that I'm going to hope the answer is yes. Maybe. Someone give me some something in the chat, maybe if they, if they can see. Uh, anyway, well, I hope, and if not, I'll just record the whole thing again. All right, so. Um, What I'm going to do now is I just want to show you a directory full of files. So, you know, I have this demo here. I have a Parquet file that's, I don't know, well, okay, not very exciting. I've also got a directory full of Parquet files. Uh, There's actually something that IOX made. It's just a bunch, you know, whatever. It's got. All right, good idea. I'll make make the font larger. There we go. So the point is it's a, it's a directory full of like 200 something parquet files. And then there's also this hit stuff parquet thing. Um, that's it, right? Hit stuff parquet. That's 14 gigabytes. It's part of the ClickBench um, benchmarks. So I'm just going to fire up the Data Fusion CLI tool and I just want to show you some examples of what you can do so that then you might uh, might be interested. So the first thing I might show is like you could do select star from uh, CPU, right? So that's limit one. So what this is doing is actually this the CPU is the directory full of files, right? It's 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 got 200 something files in it. But it's actually kind of neat. Data Fusion knows enough to be able to look in that directory and, and turn it into a, a file. So, you know, I don't know. I'm, 100 milliseconds, it's able to, to start reading this. You can also do, um, you know, uh, maybe we want to do something like we wanted to look at the average time of the, I don't know, the average idle time of my CPU or something. So you can, you can, you know, do the kind of aggregate you might expect where I'm going to just average the name, the value of the column. You know, I'm going to group it by this other column, which is called CPU. 
and I'll and I'll just do that. Right? Now the reason I'm showing you right, so that's, I don't know, it computes this and showed my for the data, the time in question, my CPU is mostly idle, which is somewhat embarrassing. But the point of me showing you this is that if you think about, about what this just did, it's it's pretty sophisticated, in my opinion. This this looks across 214 parquet files, right? Open them up, all open them up. Figured out to read, you know, decoded the right part, computed the average of the value of one of these things, grouped them by uh, one of these 16 cores, or, or I guess maybe there's 17 values, and then it and then it computed back, and it took you know less than 100 seconds or less than 100 milliseconds. So that's the kind of stuff where if you tried to write that yourself, I'm sure you could write, you know, something that computed this, but I I think it would take quite a lot of effort to get to the point where where it would go so fast. Um, Likewise, you can do, uh, I'll just show you an example of running off the 14 gigabyte, uh, oops, 14 gigabyte file from ClickHouse, right? This is a 14 gigabyte parquet file. By the way, I'm running on some three-year-old Mac, uh, Mac Pro, MacBook Pro laptop. So it's not like I have a crazy amount of memory. So if I just look at this, right? Like I run counts, this is a similar thing, right? I'm gonna look at the column of the event date from this, from this file, which is 14 gigabytes. I'm going to group it by the the number of by that event date, and it's you know it reads something like 100 million rows, and it took like half a second. So I think that's pretty cool that you you know are able to get access to that kind of technology and embed it very easily into your your program. So you know, I just want to give you a peek behind the scenes of what's happening with uh, with these query plans. To, like I keep telling you how cool and sophisticated it is. Maybe that's because I'm a database. He probably is. But if you want to start looking behind the covers to see what's actually happening here and how data fusion does this, right? I started this talk explaining that the whole reason of having a query engine is so you can like express, I just want the you know the counts of these different event dates. And I don't want to worry about how the parquet files are laid out or how to do it or how to do it fast or anything like that. I just, I just want it. All right. So let's look at what data fusion did. So I'm, I'm sorry that it's um formatted this way. And we're going to talk a lot more about what this means over the next couple of talks. But um, I just want to show you, right? This so it read a parquet file. In this case, uh, what this means is that it actually read the parquet file using all 16 cores, um, and then it did a two-phase aggregate. Again, I, I we can talk. I'll talk more about what that means. But this is a way to basically keep all your cores busy, which is why it, it was able to go so fast, right? It automatically paralyzed, and then it computed the the things that you wanted, right? So it computed averages, then it computed this other stuff and it did multiple phases. So the point of showing you this is there's actually quite a lot's going on, right? That you look at that, what looks like a simple query and it's actually, you know, quite a lot of stuff is, has happened. You can also do um, explain analyze. If you've ever seen this, this also comes built into data fusion. Um, it shows approximately the same thing, but this time it actually ran the query and it includes a bunch of uh, counters. So you can actually see in here, right, this part K file. Again, we're gonna talk more about how to read these plans shortly. Well, really next talk, but, and so in this case, you can see it actually read whatever this is, 100 million rows, right? 100 million rows out of that 14 gigabyte parquet file. Again, it's happening in half a second, it's pretty, pretty cool. You can see it's, you know, it actually turned out it only scanned a small number of bytes because it knows exactly where to find them in the in the parquet file. There's a variety of other metrics that happened here. Um, so, so yeah, so that's that's my my pitch there. You can use Data Fusion CLI. You can find a lot of cool stuff out. I'm trying, I'm trying to also give you a hint of like the stuff we're going to talk about next time. All right, so now I'm going to switch back to my slides just briefly. Um, I know I'm already nearing the end of the time we talked about data fusion CLI, but so here's an example, right? You can run this type of query. It gives you that. Uh, I showed in the demo, this is mostly on slides, that if you did explain and then give you the same query, it'll act, you know, explain. You'll actually get output that looks like this. It wasn't formatted particularly nicely on my screen because it wrapped around too much. But you'll see something like this, and you can actually read these from the bottom up. So this will show you, right, if you ever are curious what Data Fusion is doing, right, like how it actually computed the, the answer to this query, you can find out using explain, and you read these plans bottom up. We'll talk more about that next time. You can also use explain analyze, like I showed, where again, you get you basically get the same explain plan, but this time you'll also get metrics that come out the bottom. 
so in this particular example I was I was showing it was only this 40 output rows and took a lot less time because it was a much smaller file but you can still see it's doing all the same sophistication uh, in the in the query plan all right I think, yeah I guess that's what I talked about all right cool so I made it according to my clock at least exactly in half an hour so or actually probably already a little over time I hope you enjoyed the first time I'm happy to stick around and answer questions but um my plan is now I'm going to do part two uh, and sometime in the next day, a couple of days that'll talk about logical planning. And then we'll do part three, which will talk about physical planning. So I hope that was somewhat interesting to you. And I guess I'll uh, be happy to take questions now if anyone has them. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.